evening. I'm I'm Nora again, so I'm back to have this hour and a half together with you. And I'm very pleased to know that there are someone directly in the room or in, in rooms with us now, but also that there is a possibility for those who could not attend today to have a look at the video and the Prezi PowerPoints after this session has been closed. I also want to share my, my deep concerns with the situation in Syria and the last days with the brutal, brutal events in Aleppo. And it's, um, it's a situation that's just unbearable to, to even think about, let alone living through it and being helpers in that, uh, in that situation. So I want you to know that we want to express our strong feelings of solidarity and our strong wish for peace and, and a future in the region. So with these words, I would just want to start saying that we have now been through several weeks together. You have had the possibility to meet with my very fine colleagues who have been working on the development of, the, of, the, of the, this manual. And we are now going to close these week's training by presenting two major topics, namely the one related to talking about the story, both to the helper and to representatives of the authorities in order to report in a more official way what has happened. And many of you have already reflected upon this particular question and provided us with some very good replies and reflections that I will come back to when I come to that point. Then we will also talk about um, closing the story or ending the story. How can we try to convey some form of safety or some form of confidence in the lives of a person who has been exposed to severe violence when she steps out of the helper situation or the situation where she has been assisted and goes back to her family and community. The questions, how will she be received? How will she be met? Is something that you also have discussed and thought about. And I think again, that the points that you have raised are very valid and highly important. When we made this agreement about presenting some of our experiences and first of all presenting the manual to you, we had some very clear objectives and ambitions in our mind. First of all, it was to raise the awareness about some forms of human rights violations seem to be more severe than others with regards to creating a severe blow in the lives of human beings that in particular sexual violence and gender-based violence create a very serious situation in lives of women and men, and that people may feel very broken down and many develop mental health problems in the aftermath. So we want to raise the awareness that this form of human rights violation is a severe threat to the mental health of people, both individually, in families, and in communities. The second point we have wanted to raise is that gender-based violence is a serious form of human rights violation. As we spoke about the first time, it took years before actually human rights violations term was covered, was, was used to discuss and to talk about gender-based violence. Violence against women, and especially sexual-oriented violence, was often looked upon as either consequences, ill consequences of war, but not necessarily human rights violations, or it was seen as private or non-state actor violence and not something that should be dealt with internationally in a human rights context. Luckily, this has been changed very clearly. And today, violence against women, against men, sexual, sexually based violence is considered one of the most severe forms of human rights violations because it insults, 
because it in such a systematic way destroys dignity, integrity, and the rights of a person. So that is our second major point. And the third point is to try to convey some tools and some ways of approaching women who have been exposed to this form of violence, namely that helpers may feel more prepared and have some sort of support in having the manual as a tool, in, not necessarily in their pocket, but something they can resort to when one needs some, some new inspiration or to confirm that one did something which was right and felt, uh, felt a correct approach. This is important because we all know that meeting persons who have been sub abused and who have been subjected to these serious forms of violence is also a very serious challenge to the helpers. We often find ourselves in situations where we feel poor, impoverished, not having the energy to move forward, even though we are meeting people who are in a very, very dire situation and who, and who require our strength and initiatives. So sometimes we feel that the good thing would be to stay, step back sometimes a couple of steps, look into the manual, discuss with colleagues what would be good approaches here in a way to, to fill up on the professional side and also on the emotional side, on the side of the helpers. So we must never forget, as we have very frequently referred to while we went through the different parts of the manual, that we as helpers are the most important tools in the helping process. And we have to refine this tool, but it has to be, it has to be fed, it has to be taken care of, it has to be refilled, so to say. So these, perhaps in very short way, can be described as our three main objectives with those weeks that we have had. And we hope that the manual may continue to provide a useful tool for you in their daily life. We have in particular, and this makes perhaps the manual a bit different from other, other textbooks or manuals, we have based a lot of thinking on the, on the metaphor, the butterfly woman story. We have done this because we have tried to advocate the usefulness of an indirect approach to trauma, telling those who have been subjected about others who are struggling and that through the story we can get information about what are the reactions for people who have been, have been uh, living through these forms of violence, but also what may be pos possibly good and positive ways of moving ahead by training and learning about grounding exercise, by being aware of triggers, by regaining more control over your life. So this has been our way of presenting, so to speak, a trauma story and a trauma dealing with story through the story of a butterfly woman. And we would be very interested, of course, in hearing also after these sessions are, are, have ended, to hear how you have found the usefulness of this approach. I want to start by saying something in relation to telling the story. As you have noticed during the weeks that have passed, we have never directly encouraged the person to speak. We have perhaps given her room to say, you can decide for yourself what you want to share, what you want to communicate to others. It's definitely your decision to take. Nobody has a right to press or to uh, strongly encourage someone to speak if they are not ready to do so. But by supporting a person in the process, they may come to a to the moment when they say, yes, I feel the urge to tell the story. But again, then they must feel the security, the safety in the situation to be able to do so.
So if we turn to the to the slide number seven, we that is called when a survivor does ask to tell her story fully, helpers need to listen well and prepare the ground. We have put it that way because we find that even if a person comes up and say, I want to tell my story, we should dwell on this for a couple of minutes or even more to ask, are you sure you want to tell? Are you sure you want to tell me? Are you prepared that it may be difficult? Giving her some hints that telling is also experiencing and reliving. So our suggestion would be at any time to prepare a survivor very well that it can be hard and difficult, but sometimes even necessary. We do know from both from research and from clinical experience, and I'm very sure that you can um, also support this position, that sometimes talking can be relieving, but not necessarily, and we do not know that from the very start. But much of our thinking on therapy, therapeutic approaches, do, do um, um, relate itself to talking, so of course there is some value to sharing the story. But we want to underline that when a person decides to talk, it's important that we can support her while we are talking, while she is talking, by allowing her to take breaks, digest, and express her feelings. Being a kind of listener that stops, say, okay, you want a little break? I see this is very difficult for you. Let us have a drink of water. Let us breathe. Let us just take the time we need. Also, a very good approach is to help her stay in the here and now. And earlier, when we reviewed some of the grounding techniques, you have been uh, acquainted with such easy things as, can you just look around to see what you see? Doing this will bring the person back to the here and now. They are lifted out, so to speak, of very, very painful memories and are invited into the here and now. I see a window. I see a painting on the wall. I see a door. I see a stack of books. I see another person, etc. This, These are very, very simple um, ways of doing things and I frequently in my therapy room with clients who are talking about their painful memories often do this myself to bring them into the here and now before we proceed. It's important at any time to remind the person that she is in control of her story. Again, a person who has been exposed to severe human rights violations has been forced upon a situation where they are not in control. What we want to do when we help people is to bring them into a situation of control. They have control over their stories. They can decide how much they want to talk, when they want to stop, when they want to take a break. We have to remind people that this is their decision to take. And we must listen with a non-judgmental and supportive attitude. People may be very, very shameful about what has happened. Shameful things have happened to them, and they have not been able to stop it from happening. That in itself, even though we may be talking about one woman and four soldiers, even armed soldiers, women may say in the aftermath, I should have stopped them. I should have prevented this from happening. And we know so well that that would impos be impossible or it would definitely be to risk their lives in even a stronger way. So again, being non-judgmental and supportive, having this attitude is extremely important. It allows for the person to talk and convey also shameful aspects of the story and be received in a way of support 
and compassion empathy. Again, the importance of guaranteeing the confidentiality of this conversation. This is something that will not leave the room. We are aware of the problems involved if other people may know about what has happened, etc., etc. And again, it's difficult to reply to these questions for most people who have been traumatized, but it may be a good advice to ask them if they have any sort of reflection upon how long the event was and how it ended and how she knew it was over. I'm sure that you have done this to people you have spoken to, but I'm very often amazed at how much details people can talk about how it all started, how they were dragged out of a room, how, for instance, the violence started taking place, but then the memory becomes blurred. It becomes difficult to remember. In particular, it's, impor it's very difficult to remember how long it lasts. For, for, in some ways, it lasts forever, it feels, in the moment. And the point, when did it stop, or even more, when did I realize that they had stopped beating me, stopped violating my body, left me to myself, either if, if it was in the bushes or if it is in the cell or whatever, well, how did I realize that they had stopped doing the painful thing? That may be an important part to get a hold of. Again, we would never pressure. This is not something for us that we don't need this information for us. We can need to encourage her to speak about it or to recover this moment because it's a way of saying to herself, it stopped. It stopped. It's not over because psychologically it's ongoing and painful, but the evil act as such physically in the room came to an end. And if she, or for that matter he, was conscious in the room, that is, had not lost her conscious because of what has happened, which also frequently can take place, it may be a good point to remember, yes, at this point, it stopped. So one of the aspects that we try to engage in is to bring some closure to the story. This is extremely difficult, and it can also very easily be understood as a very theoretical approach, because how can we bring closure to the story? But it is about ending the story in a way that can give some hope and underline the strength that she has shown. Personally, I find that whatever she has told us about ways that she survived is something we can lift uh, as parts of a closure story. If she has resisted, she has shown an awful lot of strength and has saved her life through resistance. If she has not resisted and decided to stay very, very calm, this may be a sign or be understood as a very important sign of strength, the way she has managed the situation and probably saved her life by being able to do so. So whatever she has done, we can try to lift it up because we know she has survived and we can make that her a consequence of her doing not any mercy on the part of the violent people. It's, her, it's something of, for her making. She made it happen. She made it possible for her to survive. This is a matter of strength, and this we can say as a way of closure. You went through this horrific incident. It will probably be with you from, for a long, long time, but you managed to stay in a way that you have survived. You rescued yourself, and this is something that shows strength. This may be one way of many to close the story or to find a way to go on. But of course, it's important aspect of the storytelling 
to evaluate together with the person whether she will need some help after telling the story. What will she need when the story is told to you? Will she want to come back to you to speak about it again? Will she want to check with you what you think about what she said? Or does she want some other kind of help that you are not able to provide and that you may be talking about and discussing together? In the manual, we have in, in the PowerPoint point six, we have given quite a piece of the butterfly story. Because we often think that a part of talking about the story to a helper can be raising the question as to whether she would like or feel prepared to present the story also to public officials, that it is the authorities. Some of you have replied that reporting is possible, that there are ways of reporting, for instance, in Turkey, and there are ways that this can be dealt with in a way by the police, also including reference to specialized health care, such as psychologists, but at the same time, you have also noted to us that there are, in practice, this does not often happen because there are very few health professionals who are prepared to deal with the survivors, for instance, in Arabic. And I would, I would think that given the amount of persons with needs, this may be a rare, a rare option to have. Nevertheless, if you are a helper and have received the story, reporting it is not something we should pressure or strongly encourage. We should let this come up as an option. We may say why it could be important to report, but there is no way that we will go from the confidence that she has shown by telling us the story into in a situation where fe she feels pressured or even coerced to report. I have heard in many places that there is pressure put on people to report as a way also to obtain psychosocial assistance. To me, this is a new violation. Psychosocial assistance should be given to those who are prepared or those who want to, to, to talk and to receive help. That is a psychosocial health, mental health issue. To report is something very, very different. I do put weight in the fact that such violence is re are reported because it would be a way of documenting and registering what is happening. But again, we cannot do this, this if this is not in line with what the person feels prepared to do. So we have tried to communicate this little piece of experience through the butterfly story, which is in the manual between page 99 and 110, and in the pressy on, on PowerPoint number six. And I will read the text here. The butterfly woman asked the helper for advice. She said, what will become of me? Am I going insane? Is my life destroyed forever? She described her state of mind. I feel so alone. It is dark inside. My heart and spirit are asleep. I have bad thoughts, nightmares, and I am afraid of everything. I get angry and yell at people. I do not recognize myself. Others turn away from me. I am bad, dirty. Some days I do not want to live. I see no hope. Can I escape from this? The helper realized that the butterfly woman might be ready to tell her full story. The helper had asked before whether she would like to talk, but the butterfly woman had never been willing. The helper readied herself to listen, but needed to take certain precautions beforehand. On the day the butterfly woman needed to talk about the rape, she wanted to report it and get it from help from a lawyer. 
She wanted the men who had raped her to be convicted for what they had done. The helper told her that it could be very triggering to talk about the rape. She wished to prepare the butterfly woman so that she could do what she wanted without dissociating or becoming overwhelmed. She said, it is most important to tell the story in headlines. Avoid details because details are a strong trigger and will awaken the trauma memories again. So turning back to PowerPoint number five, we tell the butterfly woman story to show that the survivor who reports her story should identify issues that can trigger and prepare for them, avoid the strong details that can trigger her, using grounding techniques when triggering occurs. And these grounding techniques can be everything from having some stones in the hand and feel the pressure of the stones in the hand, again, to remind me of being here and now. It can be looking around to bring myself back into here and now, or it can be breathing and feeling the legs or feet under your body. So what we have here is both the talking to the helper who may be discussing what would do next. How do you think about reporting? Is that an issue? If she says, no, no way, well, this is supposed to be respected. If she says, yes, I need to report, it's highly important for me to do so, well, then the helper should be very aware of ways of preparing the reporting. And as we write here in the PowerPoint 9, sometimes it will be important to report violent incidents to relevant bodies. Always do so with the consent of the survivor and in collaboration with her. What are best practice rules when a survivor decides to describe her experience formally? How to consider the possible risks involved in reporting? And at this point, I think I also want to mention that when a person speaks to the helper, the helper does not need all details. The helper does not need to pry into to details about the story that may be very upsetting for the person who talks. But at the uh, on the other hand, if we go to the police to report and even consider that this case may be brought for a court, we have no control of the way in which the person will be asked. Frequently, when people report to police or even to NGOs who are taking down such stories, they may be in need for the details in order to, to know for sure whether the person who is reporting um, is, um, is in any way, was it, was it she or he being attacked by this person, by this group, in that context, it may be important for the documentation to be registered. But we need to prepare for this to, to happen. Also, if the person finds him or herself in the court, there is frequent experiences that the lawyers, the defense lawyers, as well as the prosecutors, may be asking very direct questions that may be painful to reply to. And fortunately, in some court rooms, there are helpers that may help and assist the person who is testifying. And in some courtrooms, there are even psychologists present who may themselves interrupt judge, prosecutor, or defense lawyers in case they see that their questions are upsetting the person who is being questioned or who is testifying. So even if there is a strong willingness on the part of the person to report, we must be perfectly aware of the fact that, yes, it takes a toll. Yes, it is complex. It is problematic to, to do so. So on page or on PESI PowerPoint number 10, we have written, before reporting, 
uh, what reporting means and applies, including risks. Some places, reporting may lead to marginalization from the community. It may lead to ostrac being ostracized from, from the group. It may be severe risks involved in reporting. So this is to be discussed with her. We shall not define the risks. She must tell us about the risks, but we encourage her to think about them. We must explore outcome, hopes, and fears. What may be the positive, possibly good things coming out of reporting? And again, never put pressure to report if she is not ready or willing. When ready, ensure all the implications. Make sure she realizes that the outcome may not bring a result that benefits her. Prepare for the possibility that retelling the story may re-traumatize her. People may believe that telling the story to police, to a court, may give her a number of positive results, such as redress, such as some kind of saying some, that someone says that they're sorry, or even some form of compensation. This should be the thing that should happen. A person who has been exposed to torture of this kind has all the rights in the world to receive redress for what they have been exposed to. But we know, unfortunately, that it's a very long way to obtain this. So before reporting, we have been speaking about the preparations and what she, what she herself decides or thinks about as positive outcome. And perhaps even one positive outcome can be the story has been told and registered, not necessarily anything much more. But this may be important in itself, also psychologically for the person involved. So what could be important during reporting, namely ensure that confidence is with the survivor, that is that she still feels that there's a confidence, encourage her to use grounding techniques if she just to make her feel present at the moment, to make sure that the environment is as safe as possible and that support is available. If a helper can be, can be present to support the survivor when she makes her report, she should, for instance, agree to a stop sign when the survivor, because this will help the survivor to hold her boundaries. By this we mean that this, the survivor may lift up two fingers and this may be a sign that she needs a help to stop, to take a break, to breathe for a while, to leave the room do anything that may help her feel more comfortable in the situation. And also, if possible, let her tell the story in general terms, headlines to avoid triggers. But as I mentioned some minutes ago, there may be situations where this is not possible. So what about after reporting? She has told her story, first to the helper, then, for instance, to the police, or to a fact-finding a mission from the UN or any other association or group that may want to and need to define and document abuses that take place. Perhaps even they suggest that she moves to even more um, assessments to, under, to underpin her story, such as, for instance, what we call a documentation and assessment of torture. We have the instrument called the Istanbul Protocol, which is defined for such purposes, which means that one assesses both psychological and physical wounds and damages in order to document this for a court, for redress, or for any other purposes that has to do with, with um, giving some justice to the victims. So after reporting. It can be important to find a good way of closure for the survivor. If possible, ensure that people are available to talk about the event. For instance, she may want to say, I feel so terrible, I was not able to say what I wanted to say. Or she may say, I feel that when I told them about the story, I really 
shamed myself out. Things like that may happen. And it's important that we manage to put the story together, find a closure again, and say to her what you said was so important. Help her to ask for information about the continuation of the case. Now that I have told the story, what will happen to the story? What will happen to me? Plan and make arrangements for the following days, such as shelter and safety. And I think I want to underline that some people do have very strong expectations as to what reporting can do to them. Unfortunately, it's not often these expectations are being met. But then we have to make the fact that it has been reported, that the, those who are responsible have been defined in some way or another. There has been a process done to, to document or to report on the violation. Make this an important aim itself, both for her but also for mankind, because we need to document the abuse in order to have also international support to try to change the state of affairs. I know that at this moment, this may sound absolutely without any content, as we see example after example of the international society not being able to stop or to deal with the atrocities that take place. Nevertheless, we must hope that there will be someday and that when that day comes, it's important for us to know what has happened, how did they, how did all this happen, what are the results, what are the consequences for those who have been attacked, and what are the numbers and the forms of abuse that take place. So, our next point would be the pros and cons of reporting, and this you have already done. You have written to us, both Melissa, uh, Fahed and Rami have submitted some important points as to, to um, reporting. And I was actually very relieved to, to read here that the, situ the legal situation is taken care of in that sense that it is not risky in itself to report. We have been to countries where reporting in itself would be high a very high risk of him or herself being detained or being punished for the story. And I'm pleased to learn that this is not the case in the context where you are working and that there is even uh, possibilities, as mentioned, to provide persons or the family with some assistance and support have they reported and have they um, told their stories. Again, I do hope that the, that the psychologist or psychological psychosocial assistance is not a direct result of reporting or is not a conditioned on reporting. But yes, I think it's a very fine thing if it's something that is provided or is suggested to after reporting has taken place. Um, there have, you have also explored the positive and negative consequences of, of Reporting, and I think that the points that you have made fall very well into what we have tried to describe in the text that we have discussed now. And it's a way of underlining that the survivor is willing to be on her feet again, as you have written. That a willingness to report, a willingness to talk, is also a way of saying, I'm going to fight this. I want to be back in my feet. I want to have justice done, I want to move this into the court, I want to benefit from what I can receive in terms of health and health care. But again, you have also mentioned that there are negative consequences of the reporting, for instance, when the reports are being disclosed without the knowing of the person, and it may cause stigma on the survivor. This is, of course, very tragic and very unacceptable. Um, the story may be important to report upon, as you have mentioned yourself, because it may be that some additional health aspects or health aspects are being taken care of in terms of redress or compensation, which will be very good. And again, you have looked into the 
the fear of having reports resulting in stigma to, to the victim. So these are very useful reflections, and I think that this is a discussion that we must have constantly, both with each other and with those who have survived severe trauma. And with this, I just take a little sip of water. One of the problems that are frequently being reported when, when um, people do want to talk about their violent experience, either to helpers or even more to, to, um, to police or other authorities. It is the psychological reactions they can feel while this is happening. And for instance, nightmares, troubled sleep as a part of the preparation may be quite frequent. As we have spoken about earlier in the sessions, nightmares, recurrent memories, intrusive memories, feelings of not having control of the memories are in themselves very, very serious attacks on the person's feeling of control and themselves. But even so, when thinking about reporting, it may be even stronger in, night, in, in the sleep and nightmares. And we may want to speak to the, to the woman who is reporting about how to deal with this. We can, and, and on, on page 13, or Pressy PowerPoint 13, you will find a list of some of the advices that may prove useful as a way of preparing herself and for, re for reporting in terms of sleep and nightmares. It's, it may be good to know your, your bedroom very well so that you can feel as safely as possible in your bedroom and you can know when you, how to move in your bedroom. I'm quite sure that many of you may have woken up from troubled dreams and all of a sudden you don't know where you are in the room and you may be very fearful because of this. Acquainting yourself with this, even have a little flashlight available, is something that can prove very helpful. Many places there will not be a lamp easily to put on, so having a little torch or anything that can give you some light or feeling of control in the situation in your own bedroom is very important. So these are small things you can speak to the woman or man for that matter about as a way of giving herself some rest prior to, to, um, to reporting. Also remember that we can obtain new, good new experience and anchor ourselves in the present by using our senses. The butterfly woman, as we read earlier, chose to touch her pillow and feel her mosquito net as a way of reorienting herself if she felt fear or very strong uh, intrusive memories. She would turn on the light, if possible, and look around the room. And she would sit up and feel her feet on the ground as a form of grounding exercise. She wakes up with heartbeat and a feeling of being back into the trauma. And she controls the situation by using some of the, some of the stabilization and grounding techniques that she has learned through the conversations with the helper. The butterfly woman, she felt that all these things could be helpful. When she did not have a light to turn on, it was very dark in the room and she used the touch and hearing to orient herself. And it may be a wise thing to do also to make your plans carefully during the day. Make yourself familiar what to choose during the day. This can be a great help also when waking from nightmares. Nightmares and severe sleep disturbances make us feel very chaotic during the day. To try to find a way to schedule our day, make it as organized as possible, given that there may be not so much we can do, but just finding ways to creating a schedule, perhaps with a helper, may be a way of reducing the tension and making things more clear more 
possible to um, to plan and a better oversight over your day. And finally, establish routines when you wake up from nightmares. Move your body. Start with the head, fingers, and arms. Feel that you're taking back your body. Touch with something that reminds you of safety, such as we mentioned, pillow, mosquito net, etc. Every survivor needs to find something that helps her. The helper and survivor can investigate options together and try them out during the day. I have personally had some good experience with suggesting people to have to have some pebbles, something that feels good to hold, something that gives you a feeling of some resistance in your hand, or it can be different forms of symbolic things or sayings or even music if you have to get yourself out of the nightmare and back into the here and now. So this, with these words, I think we have looked into the story, different aspects of the story, how to deal with the problematic sides of the story, how to move into the option of reporting the story to somebody else, somebody that is mandated to do so, that is very important. Because telling the story to someone who does not have any way of taking this down and use it in the context where it's supposed to be used may feel very difficult afterwards. So again, a helper can ensure that this is someone who is formally and physically mandated to take down stories. We will now move into what we call making a good ending. And also here you have reflected prior to this session, which is a very good contribution. But I think we could take a little break. If you want to put down any notes or comments, we have our good colleagues here, Elizabeth and Carolina, who are taking note of this. And you may want to stretch your legs yourself. And we will resume in some minutes looking into the good ending or possibly some endings of the story. So take the time to make some notes and reflections and other than what you already have done. And then we will come back in five minutes. Thank you very much. So hello, everybody. We are back again. and. Uh, I'm thrilled to, to know and to hear that we are quite quite a big group despite being late and um, and you have lots of things to do. So I was very pleased to know that we are still together. It gets, gives a very good sense of being being in something together. Um, you have uh, put some points down which I find uh, extremely challenging. First of all, as to as to the reporting, yes, there may be some some general rules in in most countries which are quite similar, such as um, such as, for instance, uh, uh, the, 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 what what are the police regulations for reporting that, according to the book, should be standard and should be okay. But I feel from both from considering country reports and from meeting different uh, authorities, there are very different practices as how these are being dealt with when, when people come to report. Uh, this is very clearly underlined, for instance, in the Convention Against Torture in, in Article 12 and 13, where there's a very clear focus on the right of everybody to report on violence and in particular torture, which may include also rape and that the person who has been exposed should be should be uh, provided safety and security and protection when she or he decides to report or to announce something that is happening but at the same time we know that people are faced with reprisals people are faced with intimidations if they want to report and i particularly thought about this when for the the example that was given by by uh, by you Hamza about um, sexual abuse from humanitarian workers against two women 
And I find this, of course, a horrific example. And when one of them decided to report and the other did not decide to report, my question is, were they fearing reprisals from someone even in the humanitarian agency? And here it's the question also, if one comes under, if one finds out about such forms of violations by people who should help, how can we hold these people to account? How can this be brought into the agency's awareness and that these people are not at all uh, in a position to help people in such vulnerable situations as they already are? So I'm, uh, I think that this question also reminds us of the importance of finding good ways of reporting and support uh, during the way for the person who wants to report. Um, I am aware that there are some technical problems some places, but um, but I, uh, yes, here, a lot of survivors refuse to report because of stigma. And I think this this is something which is difficult to, to, to know how to deal with, because on one hand, we want the, the reports of the abuse to be registered, but on the other hand, the stigma and the consequences may be so serious that it would be quite risky for us to engage or to encourage people from reporting. And the way of dealing with this is a very long, long process. So, and I think to me the, 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 the answer to stigma has been, been to say that these are human rights violations and human rights abuses. We are reporting human rights abuses. We are not, we are not documenting low morals, or sexual misbehavior or anything like that on the part of the women. We are actually reporting severe human rights abuses. But yes, I see and I, I have I know that this is the case and I do hope that a human rights based understanding of this problem will will prevail. So the um, Okay, so so I, I've looked at some of the, the comments that you have made and I think that, yes, even though some of the rules and regulations and the formal law may be quite similar in, in most countries, the practice in how to do the reporting, the practice with regard to protection and let alone the practice with regard to compensation, redress and justice in the aftermath is extremely different. and. I must say that most places it's very not developed, including in my own country. So it's something that you, the human rights international uh, community must look into. How are we dealing with survivors? What rights are we actually giving to them in practice? And how do we protect them from reprisals, from stigma, from aggression when they need to talk both to helpers and to authorities of the state who have the, the absolutely obligation to protect the citizens. But I think awareness, as you uh, have very clearly, about the complex and mixed aspect of uh, reporting is something which you need to take in also in the conversations with those who want to report because it is the pros and the cons in the discussion with the person who who has a story to report. But we may, we have been speaking as if to, you one day tell the story to the helper and the next day you report. It's not as, like this at all, as you're all aware. In some situations, we may be working, talking to the helper for a long time. They may want to come back to the helper, to want to speak more want to have some more confirmation that this is not madness, that this is really experienced life, that the reactions that they have are understandable reactions, as they have been described also in The Butterfly Woman. And that this can be a process that goes on for weeks and months before the person says, now I'm ready to report. I myself have experienced this with clients who just reporting in the beginning of our therapeutic or our conversational process was absolutely something they would never even consider. 
having worked for a while, working on this, looking at the human rights aspect of it, looking at their own reactions, how to deal with it, it may come to a point where they say, I think I'm ready to report. And that's a good moment. And then we start the discussion about, okay, how to go on with the report. We have been thinking about how to end the story. And as you may imagine, there are as many endings to the butterfly story as there are human beings in the world. So there are many ways of doing this. We have been using terms such as closure. How can we, in our conversations with the survivor, find a way not to close necessarily, but find a closure in terms of being able to live with it, being able to live with the story. Not a story of my being totally destroyed, but by my being exposed to, um, to severe human rights violations. Yes, I managed to handle it as best as I could at the moment. I have tried to lift up my resources ever since and I'm continuing my life as the person I am with the dignity that I have been able to regain, hopefully, hopefully. There are, when we have discussed the butterfly story, we have been thinking, how can she come back to community? She may have been outside of her family or community for a while, or she may have been in the community, but not feeling a part of that community not feeling not feeling integrated or as part as the community in terms of respect and and being looked upon as a person with dignity and one of the others so it's a way of how to prepare and we have spoken about shame and about stigma are there ways we can work with the communities tell the communities that men women and children are exposed to human rights violations where they suffer so strongly that they need all the community support to be able to return. There is no such thing as a shameful human rights violation. The, sh the shame is on the perpetrator, not on the survivor. Can we encourage the community to have an approach to the survivors of celebrating that they have survived rather than putting them down with shame and stigma. Yes, these are idealistic thoughts, but I think it's worth working on them to see if we can affect community to accept and to integrate. And again, there is nobody who can force anyone to tell their story to the whole community. What needs to be known is that the person has been exposed to severe human rights violation and is suffering psychologically and physically and needs acceptance and support from family and from community. We have been working also with models such as conversations with survivor and family when she returns to her family to find ways of how can the family be supportive? How can they assist her in her sleep? How can they help her to feel good again, to feel active again, to feel worthy again, to feel useful again? Sometimes families may be very unaware of what could be best way of helping. Others just naturally understand the importance of support. And as we have spoken about earlier also in, the, in this, these sessions, social contact, social support, social um, being with others is the best, seem to be the best ways to buffer and to prevent trauma from being chronic, lasting over many, many years. It's a way of coming back into the place where you have left psychologically or physically. Sometimes they have been there all the time, but psychologically they have been away. 
You may have seen families where one or two have been exposed to severe trauma and they are practically not present in the family. They are dissociated, they are detached, they are so afraid that they are not part of the family. Bringing them back into the family, setting them into the, in the, in the activities of the family, bringing them into the situation where they can feel as members of the family with the dignity of the other family members here is of great essence. So in, I think that when we work as helpers, either we use a butterfly thinking in the back of our head, whether you use it together in the conversations with survivors, we might want to discuss how can you regain the life that was uh, breached or ma made so different by the trauma. How can you regain a sense of belonging to family and community? What can we do in terms of preparing community? What can we do in terms of preparing family? How can we bring these together? So if you see the PERSI points on 16 and 17, these are summarized um, in these ways. <laughs> and when we say bring the story to success is of course shooting the arrow very, very high, but we, we want to, to create a situation where the trauma story can go over into the next step, not being an acute trauma anymore. Sorry. <coughs> but being the bridge into a more normal life where she or he can feel that they regain functions in family. As one woman I spoke to said, now I can start feeling a mother of my children again. I felt so bad I did not even want to talk of myself as their mother. Or now I can feel that I can be the wife of my husband again. I felt so bad. I felt so ugly. I felt so terrible. I felt I could not say I was my husband's wife anymore. So again, these are so important self-instructions to change, to have people come back into their own life, to feel that they can regain at some point the person they once, they once were and into their family and in their activities. And in this story, we have focused a lot on talking, being with, support, grounding, tools, etc. But we know from both from research and clinical work, being active is so important. And if there's any way that we can engage people in activities, in everything from very practical shores to more complicated ways of supporting others, this may be of value. And some of you have really pointed at that point in particular too, that bringing a person out of the pain can be a way, can be done also by inviting her into a situation where she can share the pain of others and even give advice and input to others about her own experience and her own pain. So some of you have even, as the success ending of the story, seen the woman as a hero. And not many days ago, I met a Syrian woman who was here in Norway. She had herself suffered tremendous amount of, of suffering. She had, uh, in Syria, she developed a NGO working with survivors, supporting them, and was now in Norway in order to obtain some support and some, um, some understanding for the important work that civil society organizations like this are able to do even in the, in the situation that is fearful and very, very frightening. So again, looking into ways of concluding the story and helping her back. Sometimes when I think about my own practice as psychologist, I think in the beginning that for me the criteria for having done a good job is when she tells me 
that she is now able to to go out and have a good time, take her family out to to a picnic, do something really, really ordinary but very nice. Be able again to organize her kitchen, again to look into the books that she read when she had her former work. Going back to all these things that identified the, the, the life that once was. So we do not have to make heroes out of all of them. If we can, if we can create a situation where they are feeling more or less accepted in their own lives and able to take back some of their activities, I think we have a very good, good termination of the work that we are doing. So, um, I think that this is approaching a form of a, not a conclusion, because this work will never be concluded, but we can look into what have we been trying to, to, um, to work on, what do we want to, to take home, so to say, of the lectures and of the reading that you have done. And if we should look together at the the request or the points included in in the Pressy number twenty one to take home, we have tried just to formalize some very basic principles and some that we have called take home messages that are very wise to have in our mind at all times when we are working with survivors of extreme violence. And especially in a situation where, it's, where the tension is so high, the level of fear is so high, and the, the fear is objectively very, very, there's a reason to be, to be fearful. It may be important that we as helpers remind ourselves what is it that makes us tick, what are the principles that we must never forget, even in such a stressful situation? And we have tried to summarize these um, as a part of the working, working with survivors, that always communicate your willingness to give support. It's something that we can initiate and express from ourselves. We are there to try to give some support if this is accepted. Respect is so, so important. That includes listening, taking time, not pushing, being a little bit backwards, and in every possible way, underline that we meet the person with respect. That is, looking into the person, they do not need to look at us. I will never have ask anyone to look at me because my, some people will want to look down and feel shameful or have a difficult time. But then I could say, okay, I would, um, I will want to talk to you. I will be very much addressing the person, even though they may reject me. But addressing not as a pressure but as a way of showing support and showing respect showing a respectful calm attitude also ask for permission to sit down together is it okay that we can sit here together balance distance and closeness some people have a tendency to set their chairs or to be very physically close to another person to people who have been exposed to these severe violations this may be a threat this may feel like an intrusion. Somebody have already intruded their body, and although we have no such intention, it's important that we find, is this a good distance? Is it okay that I sit here? Do you want me closer, or do you want me more at a distance? Again, what are we saying with this? We're saying that we are flexible. We're saying that we are respecting their will, and we're saying that they are the ones to decide. We are also giving the survivor enough time to take us in. Because we cannot expect that the 
that the survivor in a very few minutes will say, oh, yes, that's fine, you're a perfect helper, here we are. No, we don't even need them to say anything of that sort. We just need to say, are you accepting that we can sit here together and we can talk about what seems natural and good for you to talk about? Give the survivor time to take you in. Get used to it in a way. And this is even more so when you need to, to work with, a, with, an, with an interpreter. Because the interpreter needs to be as confidential and, and as a person to be, and uh, also to respect the survivor as much as the helper. So I would say that when working with interpreters, spend a lot of time of instructing the interpreter because they may sometimes perhaps be a bit hasty or perhaps even impatient while we want them to be respectful and also laid back, that is, to, to mirror our position. Do not ask a lot of questions. If you have to ask some questions, ask for permission. Is it okay that I ask you some questions now? This is, again, when you're, not, when you're in a position as a helper. I'm not speaking about you as a border control, as a police, or as a human, or as someone who is at the reception center of a refugee camp or whatever, I'm speaking about you as a interpersonal helper. Then you may want to portion your questions, not rush again with all the questions at the same time. Let the survivor understand that she can talk or that she can be silent. Don't let don't make a person feel a fool if they don't want to speak in the beginning or even take breaks. Some people may feel that it's good to be seated, to be quiet, and you may say, perhaps it's best for you now that we sit here together without talking. You're mirroring the person's reactions without steering it or pushing it or uh, denying it or mocking her. Remind her that she is in command of her own story. You may have it, they, you may say that you have, you understand that she's in pain, that she has a painful memory that she is, that's plaguing her, but it's up to her whether she wants to talk, what she wants to say, <coughs> and when she wants to talk. <coughs> Excuse me. The air in Norway is very dry. Every case and every survivor is unique. A helper, excuse me. Every case and every survivor is unique. We hope that when we have described some of the strategies, the tools, the approaches, the ways of talking, we have provided ideas and, and tried to share ideas of how to do it. Not necessarily this is the one that fits everybody. It's the flexibility and the way of listening that is so important. A helper must always think for herself and always use her own imagination and judgment when she decides what stories to tell, what advice to give, and what grounding exercise to use. There may be reasons why we don't want to use a grounding technique which has to do with feeling the feet under the ground. And one very obvious reason, of course, is if we're speaking to a person who has been tortured by Falanga, who, has, who have been hit uh, heavily under the foot soles, then foot soles towards the, or to the, to the um, floor will not give any form of good feeling. On the contrary, it will be a reminder of pain. So here we, we, we could use other forms of, of grounding. Sitting, feeling, feeling, the, feeling the body on the chair, feeling, uh, feeling the breathing in your, in your chest, or feeling, as we have mentioned, the stone in your hand. So again, what story do you want to tell? Is the story that we have suggested something that can be used as a metaphor sometimes on and off? Is there other stories? Do you want to tell about an imaginary other woman that spoke to you some days ago that was from a totally different part of the country but who came to you with a story? Something you're sharing either out of your imagination or out of your clinical experience 
but it may be an, or, an indirect way of saying persons with the severe human rights violations that you have lived through with the pain that you have, may have been suffering may often feel that the world has fallen apart, that they are not themselves anymore, that people regard them with, with shame, etc. So we're trying to give some explanations about frequent reactions after trauma without saying that this is what you feel or you must tell me what you feel. But we provide with some reflections, informations where she can say, yes, Exactly. This is how I feel. And yes, it is good to know that I'm not crazy. Then we have listed important to ask certain questions. I mean, these are questions for us to ask also to ourselves. What resources can the survivor draw on in herself and in others? We would often be the ones to define the resources, to encounter them, to describe them. This, this is for the individual, him or herself, or for the community or the society. What are possible resources that you can use that can enable you to go forward? Oftentimes, we're very problem-focused, which is very easy to understand why we're problem-focused, because that is what we're working with. But we need to have a very clear resource perspective in our work, and our hope by by communicating the butterfly woman is that we hope to communicate some resources that the person can build on. Then the question, will I or other helpers see her regularly or just a few times or only very occasionally? This is important to ask ourselves because if we are seeing a person and we know already that this will be the one and only time, we may have to regulate how we work with the person because there's no way that she will be able to come back for different reasons. This is always very difficult to have a one session or over some hours for that matter. But we can work in a very different way if we know that the person is around, that the person may be summoned to, to a conversation, or the person herself may be able to ask, may I come back for a conversation? So again, this will also steer the way that we approach these um, um, approach how we talk. <clears throat> As a helper, how much do I know about her situation? Do I know enough? We may want to find out perhaps something about her context in, in order not to give her advice that may be very counter to the situation she lives in. And also in order to understand her reactions, we may want to know a little bit about her situation. It may be cultural, religion, family life. Again, also to find ways of um, finding resources. I remember when I've been working with refugees over a number of years, how useful it could be to, to hear about their resources, for instance, in terms of religion, in terms of traditions, things that could help them um, move on and to make them feel a bit stronger. <clears throat> if I And then we have the question, if I ask her to trust me, am I in a position to sustain that trust? This is very important. If we present ourselves as persons to be trusted, we have to be trusted. We must keep the story to ourselves until the point where she can say, no, I want to report this or I want you to share the story with this with with a doctor, for instance, in order for me to be to be examined further. Or we can say that we could not sit with this story without asking also for some collaboration from others. Again, we must be very aware of when we ask for trust, we must, we must deserve this trust. And we must be very open about our limitations, if there are such limitations steering our work. <coughs> also to ask ourselves, am I in a sound position to advise her? Do I have the set of advices to share? Or could I, instead of advising, perhaps just reflecting on things aloud when she can decide whether she wants to take these pieces of reflection or not to herself? As a helper, am I promising too much? 
Can I sustain the help I'm offering? Very important question to ask ourselves. It's easy to ask too much, and oftentimes, when reporting, perhaps especially to, to groups that are very eager to make justice, people may promise too much. There are a number of studies around in the world where victims have been visited and interviewed and been promised redress, compensation, justice, a number of different things, that they, yes, they do have the right. They do have the right to all this. But in practice, these rights are not being safely insured in their lives. So we must be careful with what we can offer and what we can promise. And if we promise, can we really keep this promise? Can we keep um, the, the, or the help that we are offering? <clears throat> and yes, so this is, these are some of the points that I think that are, you, may be useful for reflection, for helpers, in order to be aware of the many, many pitfalls that we're facing in this important work. But to, to conclude, at least for now, um, I think it has been such a very challenging and very interesting and also warming experience to be in touch with all of you, to know that in situations that are so complex that you have been interested in and wanting to share your thoughts and listen to some of our our ideas that we have wanted to share with you has been big, big honor on our side. And we hope that these input and the contact that we had can be something of a little inspiration and perhaps giving you some energy in the very, very hard work you're facing every single day. And I'm very, very proud to know that we can remain in contact through Hamsa and through the fact that we have names and emails and we will also very much want to come back to you and ask you whether have you been able to share some of these thoughts with your colleagues? Have you been finding some of the tools and some of the approaches useful in your work? Perhaps even survivors have come up with ideas that you would like to share with us. That happens also frequently. So in many ways, um, it, it, we hope very much for an ongoing fruitful dialogue with you. And I think I want to, um, to, to open if there's some more questions at this point that you want to, to, to send us and we, or to give us. And we also will send you an end questionnaire for you to answer and complete this training because we all want to give you the certificates towards the end of this training. So in deep respect for all of your work, I want to to say goodbye, not for not for always, but at this point goodbye and very warm regards from Elizabeth and Carolina who are here. Also from Elin and from Helen and from Doris that you have already met in the sessions. They have all been very, very pleased to be able to engage with you. And we of course would have liked to see you here with us also. So all the best to you and you will hear from us and we will stay in touch. A million, million thanks to you, you all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good luck in your very important work. <laughs>